Imagine living in a world surrounded by glowing dogs, flying pigs, and hibernating space-traveling astronauts. While you might consider these ideas science fiction, thanks to the discovery of something called CRISPR, they might be closer than you think. Before diving into CRISPR, let's take a moment to break down the building blocks of life. Life is made up of DNA, which you can think of like an instruction manual for an organism like you, me, or perhaps a tree. DNA tells your cells what proteins to make, which determine things like whether you have blue or brown eyes. And these determinations are what make up your genes. And all of your genes together make you who you are, which scientifically we call your genome. Now you may be asking what all of this has to do with CRISPR. CRISPR is a sequence within DNA that was discovered in bacteria by Japanese scientists in the late 1980s. It stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. Ugh, I know. While the name for this sounds intimidating and complex, the idea is pretty simple. Megan Hochstrasser, who works at the Innovative Genomics Institute at UC Berkeley, helps explain. CRISPR is a system found in bacteria. They're actually fighting off viruses every day. So in addition to viruses like the coronavirus that infect us, that we have to fend off, um, bacteria have their own viruses called bacteriophages or phages that infect them. And so they need to have their own sort of immune system in order to not get just totally wiped out by phages. So they have a lot of different systems that they use, but one of them is CRISPR. And so CRISPR is essentially a system that takes a little snippet of the DNA from this invading virus and then uses that the memory of that virus. And then it arms these proteins, these CRISPR proteins, to find the virus again when it invades and to cut its DNA to stop the infection. Remember the building blocks that make up life? That's right, DNA. Megan explains how the discovery of CRISPR has equipped scientists with the tools needed to change the DNA of any life form. Scientists kind of realize like, wow, this sounds like it's basically a tool that we can program to cut DNA wherever we want. And so instead of just letting that go off and continue to fight viruses, um, scientists took it out of the bacteria and are now using CRISPR systems in plants and animals and humans to make targeted cuts in DNA that lead to changes in the sequence. So it's, it's basically a DNA editing tool that we took, co-opted from nature and have repurposed. Um, for our, our own means. This means that we can now change the DNA of any organism, meaning that we can change genes, meaning that we can alter genomes, meaning we can conceivably rewrite the book of life. You may already know that gene editing is not a new concept. In fact, some argue that we've been doing it for thousands of years. Think of how we have selectively bred dogs, whether to be cuter, more loyal, or better sheep herders. This is, in fact, a form of gene editing. It's just much slower and takes generations and generations to see the results. More recently, and since the 1990s, we have edited the genes of plants, animals, and humans using advanced scientific techniques by introducing genes from one organism into another to, for example, make crops more resistant to disease, provide therapy to help treat diseases like cancer, and even clone animals. So you may be asking what the big deal about CRISPR is if we've already been doing similar things for a few decades. The difference is that with previous techniques, gene editing was inaccurate, expensive, and time-consuming. I spoke with Jim Lalonde, a microbial genome engineering expert who talks about how CRISPR has changed how we edit genes. So now, um, with CRISPR, you can do things that were inconceivable even a few years ago. The barrel where you're getting over the being able to read it, but being able to change the image is just blows people's minds. And I guess the difference is the scale. So so now you can make thousands of changes in, in one you know, the hands-on time of a scientist would be less than an hour. And you could make thousands of changes uh, rapidly. You know, fifteen years ago it would be somebody's entire PhD thesis and, and several years, you know, five, seven years of work to do just one of those changes. Now we do a thousand of them in less than an hour. But so again, that's the kind of the speed that the technology is changing. We also spoke about economics. 
Where old gene editing tools could cost thousands of dollars, a CRISPR starter kit can be as affordable as $65. This has, for better or for worse, enabled a democratization in gene editing that has manifested itself in thousands of people working on editing genes within both formalized scientific communities and informalized backyards and garages. More precision, speed, and economic access means that scientists can use CRISPR to innovate to a degree that was once inconceivable. For example, since 2014, over 200 CRISPR patents per month have been filed for. Compare this to an average of just 10 patents filed per year in the early 2000s for all gene editing applications, not just CRISPR. The question remains, how are scientists currently applying this powerful technology? You can theoretically use CRISPR to edit any kind of gene that exists, and being the curious cats that we are, you might imagine that's exactly what we are doing. But outside of creating flying pigs and glowing dogs, there are a few key areas most scientists are working on. There's, there's things that we can do with this technology that are going to help solve um, existential problems that we facing like climate change. You know, disease, to some, some of them are probably really simple to, to cure in the next decade. While most people agree that using CRISPR to cure certain diseases is okay, there are possibilities that exist far beyond this type of application that for many give rise to concerns. Additionally, the ethics of CRISPR transcends the question of if it's okay to meddle with life and spills over into the power dynamics of our institutions and the accessibility of CRISPR-based gene therapies. The primary issues, therefore, are consent, unintended consequences, power, and access. CRISPR has the power to permanently change the genes of humans that haven't been born yet, which in turn affect the genes of their children, and their children, and their children, and their children, and so on. If you aren't able to ask children and their offspring if gene modification is something they consent to, is it okay to make those changes? Most say no, but there are scientists who have already crossed this line. A Chinese scientist who edited embryos, so human embryos, and implanted them in a woman and they were born into two babies and there's thought to be another pregnancy as well where there's a at least one more baby so these are gene edited human beings who were edited before they were actually born and they're the only people on earth who who have that um who can say that about themselves even though as a community we've been talking so much about not making edited humans before the technology is ready and not making edited humans before the public understands what this is and can weigh in on it. Someone just went ahead and did it anyway. By using CRISPR to change an organism's DNA, we are tampering with natural evolution. And there are arguments that point to the idea that bad genes can actually be very beneficial in certain environments. For example, humans who inherit one sickle cell gene can better defend themselves against viruses like malaria. And so editing the sickle cell gene out of a human, which would help in ensuring they don't get sickle cell disease, may increase their chances of contracting and dying from malaria. Therefore, many scientists believe it's incredibly important to understand the full complexity of the consequences that may emerge due to such changes. Could it be that by alleviating one problem, we create five more? It is no longer just a theoretical possibility that one individual, company, or government possesses the power to change life as we know it. And with a technology that is far more accessible than any gene editing technology of the past, many ask how we best safeguard ourselves from potential negligent, purely commercial, and or maleficent acts. Where there is technology and innovation, there is also money. And where there is money, there is inequality. Unfortunately, the current state of CRISPR-based gene therapies can bankrupt the individuals seeking to use them to cure life-threatening or debilitating diseases. For example, Novartis, a multinational pharmaceutical corporation, has discovered a way to use CRISPR to treat spinal muscular atrophy 
for over a price of a million dollars. And while taxpayers often fund the research and development of such cures, individually they also bear the brunt of paying for them too. When these treatments become more regular and more available, the question becomes how expensive will they be and who will be able to access them? The main thing I'm actually more worried about is probably just access and people not being able to access these treatments. That to me is a huge concern and it's something that is sort of going to be a problem inherently just because of how the technology works. Um, it's not something that you just like easily give a shot and someone is cured of something. It's, it's much more complicated. Um, you have to deliver it to different organs. Like if my brain has a, a genetic disorder I'm trying to treat, we need to get these CRISPR proteins into my brain, which is not easy to do. Solving the challenge of getting these components into the right place in the body is actually really difficult. So I think we need innovation in how we deliver the, the CRISPR system in order to treat more diseases and to make the cost go down a little bit. The future of CRISPR is still undecided. There are lofty ideas about using it to help humans better adapt to space travel and life on Mars, and also more immediate and pressing ideas about using it to address climate change and disease. And while there are those that disagree with using such a powerful technology like CRISPR at all, the writing is on the wall and it's telling us that CRISPR is here to stay. The question is if, if it will be a technology that takes us toward a more sustainable, equitable, and healthy future, or will it increase the divide between the haves and have-nots while impacting our world in ways we might not yet be able to conceive. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like and subscribe button. I'll see you next time.